Greetings everyone, my name is Flair Blitz and welcome to It Gets So Lonely Here. This is a Yuri Yandere cannibalism horror visual novel in which you are lost in the woods. You have no map, no route, no plan, but we are here nonetheless. There's a link down in the description below where you'll be able to download this game for yourselves to play. Although do be warned, this game has some discomforting things such as drowning, being buried alive, cannibalism, bullying, illness, and vague references to homophobia. Let us start this adventure. You are running through a forest. It is late at night and the sky is as pitch as black. There is nothing to light your way save for the moon's milky glow. But its rays cannot reach you. Not properly. The trees which surround you just out of the earth like eerie monuments to a foreign god are blotting out most of the light. You cannot see where you are going, even if you have commenced your flight at a more sensible hour, however. With the light of the sun to aid you, it would be of little use. You do not know where you are going. You have no map, no route, no plan. You are running like a frightened animal, anxious and nervy, with no destination in mind. You have no desire as you run, save to escape. You cannot let yourself be caught. If that were to happen, you are certain that you would be ruined. You have no choice, therefore, but to keep going on and on and on. Though your feet are screaming at you for mercy. I love the background noises and the UI. You have no idea how long you have been running. Time has begun to blend together. It has lost all meaning. I don't know what 7pm is or 7am. Something sharp snags at the hem of your skirt. But you do not have the luxury to pause and examine what has happened. Instead, you tug. Your skirt tears, the sound splitting through the forest, and you stumble forward with a shocked gasp. You are free, but at what cost? Your skirt has been irrevocably damaged. It might be too late to worry about such trivial matters now, though, if you do not start running again, and soon she will catch you. Oh, so there's some background story to this, then your life will be over. You do not know if she is still following you, but you do not want to risk looking over your shoulder, because in any horror scenario, you never look back. If you were to see her, silhouetted beneath a tree, looking at you with that sickly sweet smile, which once ensnared you, you would lose what little nerve you possess. Your legs would lock up and your blood would freeze in your veins. Then, you would crumble. You would fall, but you would not hit the ground. She would be there to catch you, to ensnare you. Did she not promise that you made that contract, that you would never be alone? Why would you make that contract in the first place? You would like to take back that silly wish of yours. But it is too late for that. It is too late for a lot of things. All you can do is run. You run and run and run while icy fog swirls around your feet. It is cold enough to sap the heat from your body and you shudder from it. It feels as though you are drowning. It feels as though you are being buried alive. Your knees and your shins, meanwhile, are bleeding. You cannot endure much more of this. But if you value your own life, you must. You run and you run and you run until at long last, you reach a fork in the road. There are three paths which split off through the forest. Well, four if you count the path down which you came. You cannot exactly double back on yourself, though. Not when you have put so much effort into running forward. You can only press on. The three paths are signposted. 
and this game mentions that there are three different ways in which you can meet your demise, which is something of a strange sight given you are so deep in the forest. Dark though it might be, you have grown accustomed to the shadows, for I live in the shadows. You can just about pick out the writing on this old, dilapidated signpost carved and slanted through it is. Though it is, sorry. Your fate, if you will forgive me for sounding cliche, is in your hands. Not this fourth wall breaking shenanigans. Now I wonder, which path will you take? Which path will I take, huh? Well, that's going to have to resolve a save in order to know where it is that I want to go. Of course, to the castle is the most magical of all. So you want to go to the castle? Good idea. No, you want to go to the castle. You, as the protagonist, made that choice. All decent fairy tales tend to conclude in castles once they're beleaguered. So, beleaguered. I don't know how to pronounce that word. Put upon heroines are finally able to wed the handsome princes they once dreamed of. Also, just realize that castle also are places where a lot of torture devices are kept. Why bother trying your luck with the shore, which may very well be deserted? Or the village, which will be full of dirty, barefoot peasants? Okay. It is far better to skip the suffering and go straight to the grand finale of your life. That is very astute of you. I did not realize you had it in you to be so ma mercenary. I could only wonder what you will uncover during your moonlight mendelings. The night is far from over and your adventures are only just beginning. The contract has only just begun. I hope only that you have brushed up on your courtesies. They might come in handy when one is interacting with a sovereign. Royals can be temperamental after all, that's an understatement, if you fail to treat them with the prerequisite amount of respect, you might come to regret it. You follow the path which leads to the castle, supporting yourself on weary aching legs which Feel ready, at a moment's notice, to detach from your hips. You are little more than a wisp of a girl, but you have been running for so very long. And your feet are so very numb, you feel like a so very great lumbering fiend, clumsily and ungainly for so very. The soles on your feet are screaming at you for so very long. You need to lie down, and quickly. Your only hope is to continue to run, but you will find a spare room available for you in the castle. You do not know what exactly will await you at the castle, but you have visions. As you run, of a vast, a loop, I don't know how to say that word, dwelling, opulent. This dwelling will surely be full of finely furnished rooms in which you might rest your weary head. There must also be a king and a queen inside this castle, you ponder. Who would be kind and wise? And what of their children? What of a princess? Every good castle must possess a princess who will take pity on you and your plight. You can imagine the face of this generous princess with ease, thanks to the fairy tales you read in abundance as a small child. The princess will be fair of hair and blue of eye, with soft pink lips pursed like rosebuds. Her limbs will be slender, her hands dainty and unsullied from physical labor, and her sensibilities will be sweeter than marzipan. She will be kind to you and compassionate, just like an older sister. You do not know what older sisters are like, though. Or younger sisters for that matter, for I am a soul child. You are only guessing. Only child, sorry. You are not a complete fool, however, despite your tendency to daydream. And you do have a few reservations. Monarchs do not, as you know from a vocarious reading, 
have the best track record when it comes to caring for the peasantry. Was there not a very famous queen who once said, with a cavalier wave of her hand, that the hungry peasants in her kingdom should content themselves with cake if bread was not an option? You think that this might be a m misquote, but the point still stands. Though royals are supposed to grant their subjects succour in their time of need, this does not always happen. In fact, it very rarely happens. Kings and queens and princesses and princes are just people at the end of the day, and they are subject to the same caprices to, that all humans are. They can also be careless and selfish and inconsiderate, just like any other human being. There is no guarantee that this mythical princess of your imagination will help you. Why, there's no guarantee that this mythical princess exists at all. Still, you must try. It is this hope which keeps you going. You continue to run to the castle. It takes some time before you finally emerge from the woods. But finally, you do it. How well, sorry, how much time, you ask? I cannot answer that. Do I not say that time has begun to lose all its meaning? The forest is behind you now, at least, and all of the awful nightmares which dwelt within it. It is still cold, though, and foggy, and very, very dark. The sun is yet to rise. You can see the moon more clearly now, though, as it hangs above your head, round as any pearl or orb, or crystal ball. The moonlight shines down upon the castle, which looms in front of you like a cliffside. The stone edifice of the building is imposing, and it drowns you in shadows darker than the depths of the deepest ocean. The castle is not at all dark, though, not like the night's sky above it. When you crane your head, you can see that there are lights flickering within, in the narrow, sleeted windows. It would appear that somebody is home. The king and the queen, perhaps? What of their servants? What, perhaps more pressingly, of their guards? You half expect as you stand there that armored knights will accost you for daring to approach the castle of king and queen so-and-so. Do you not know your place, foolish peasant girl with the dirty skirt? Be gone with you. You are not, of course, a peasant. Your family is a wealthy one. Or rather, they were, before your father made a series of poor financial decisions. You do not look like a young lady right now, though. With your dirty face and your dirty skirt and your dirty mu- Anyways, we're just torn at the hem. If any guards were to take you for a vagrant, it would not be surprising. But though you stand there differing, your filthy fingers hooked in front of your filthy skirt, you do not hear any cries. Nobody sounds the alarm. Lights might be on inside the castle, but there is nobody outside of its parameters standing sentry, which is very surprising. There is nobody to impede your entry and the elaborate iron gates which are set into the vast stone walls about the castle's exterior are open. Just a crack. It would be a trivial matter to slip inside. There's nobody to stop you. Why are you trembling now, you silly thing? You have come so very far it would be an act of foolishness to turn around now. Go on. Go. You inhale. Perhaps an attempt to screw up your courage, which has at long last begun to fail you. And then you step forwards. You slide between the wrought iron gates, as stealthy and as secretive as a thief. A crab thief. Then cross the path which leads up to the tall, imposing structure. The domed doorway which leads into the castle itself Pone from stone is closed, but 
At a push of your palm, it swings inwards. The door creaks alarmingly as it opens. The sound loud enough to split the silence like a thunderclap. You inhale at this. And glance around, your eyes darting hither and thither. If there are any guards posted about the castle's grounds, they should all have been alerted by the sound. Will they come for you? At long last. What will happen should they catch you? Will they throw you in the dungeons? That does not sound like a pleasant way to spend the night. At least you would have a roof over your head though, and you would not have to keep walking. Your feet really do ache. You stand there for an indeterminable amount of time, your heart pounding a panicked, irregular rhythm in the base of your throat. But no matter how much time elapses, no guards come. You are thankful for your good luck, but it does make you wonder exactly, where is everybody? Why? Is it almost as if all the people in the world have disappeared? Yes, it's just you and that girl that's been chasing you. Could you be the very last human left alive? Hmm, you frown, then press your palm back against the door. You push less cautiously, this time heedless of the loud sound which splits the silence. There's no point in worrying about the guards, not when they might very well be non-existent. And inside, your entry to the castle secured. You then take a step forward, with every step echoing the glamorous hallways. The door swings shut behind you, and the resultant slam makes you jump. You do not expect it. Your heart knocks against your ribs and, with wild eyes, you glance about. You are standing, sorry, standing, sorry, in a vast entrance hall made of stone which splits off into any number of passages, just like the fork in the road in which we had earlier. At the very end of the hall, meanwhile, there is a large elaborate staircase, one of which seems to extend to the heavens themselves. It is dark inside the hall, but there are numerous torches set in stone sconces in the stone wall, which are aflame. They offer some relief from the shadows. You can hear the faint sound of the wind outdoors as it moans against the castle's impervious walls, but you cannot hear any footsteps. You cannot hear any voices. You cannot, more importantly, hear any people. Maybe the castle is empty. If that is the case, though, then who lit these torches? That girl who's chasing you. It is a curious conundrum. You muster up what remains of your courage, then cry out, addressing the empty hall in timorous voice, which fails to properly fill up the space. Hello, you say, your eyes wide. Is anybody there? Your voice echoes through a vast empty hall, but it is met, yet again, with silence. You cannot say you are too surprised, but it is somewhat disappointing. Not once to be, so not want to be deterred, you try again and again. Your voice growing louder with each subsequent attempt. Sorry, attempt. Sorry. No matter how loud your voice is, however, it fails to reach any ears. If anybody is here, they do not seem to be particularly sociable. That, or perhaps they sim simply cannot hear you. I can hear you. I can... Well, I can see you in some kind of predicament. Could they be in another room? Yes, that must be it. You will never find that pretty fairy tale princess of your imagination if you stand idle, you know. Perhaps the pretty fairy tale princess is you who is watching after all. It is time to get to work. Put those legs of yours to good use. Not knowing what else to do, if there's anything you can do, you begin to explore. You examine the rooms first on the ground floor of a castle. 
which are of a similar scale to the impressive entrance hall, large and richly furnished, and sorry, but utterly unoccupied. After some time of aimlessly meandering, encountering nobody save the ghosts of Aeon's past memorialized on portraits upon the walls, you must have courage to ascend to the second floor. Somehow, this person that's chasing us can transcend time and space and warp us to an alternate reality where it's just the two of us. This floor, too, you examine, wandering through a seamlessly endless series of hallways until at long last, you find a door which is ajar. From between the crack in the door and the, and the jamb, you can see the flickering light. Irregular, yes, but it is a light nonetheless. Could it be from a fireplace? That would suggest then that this room was occupied, unlike all the others. Perhaps the kindly princess you dreamed of will be awaiting you in this room. It is with a trembling hand that you press your palm against the door. You push it. Then you step inside the bedchamber, which unreveals itself to you, dear viewer. Shyly, you stand in the threshold of the chamber, much of your courage extinguished and gasped. All right, we can do that. Excellent. The bedroom itself is gorgeous. It is a chamber so luxuriant, not even the shadows can obscure the fine craft of the furniture within it, nor the rich patterns on the walls. It is the girl inhabiting the chamber, however, who truly takes your breath away. Hello! Sitting upon the velveteen sheets of a towering four poster is a girl in a sumptuous red gown, sorry, gown, sorry, who seems to be of a like age to you. You do not have a clear view of a girl's face. Her head is bowed, her gaze directed downwards, <coughs> excuse me, at her lap. You can tell from her hair, however, and from her slender caves, which protrude from beneath the hem of her dress, that she is very pretty. The girl's hair is golden, just like freshly cut wheat, but it is the red of her dress which truly captures your attention. But why just the red of the dress itself that is truly enamoring? She is so striking you cannot look away from her. The girl is not alone in her chamber either. She has a companion, but this companion is not half so endearing as she. In her lap, perched upon her velvet skirt, is a doll. The doll's hair, like that of her mistress, is, is golden, though much of it is hidden beneath her bonnet. The girl is adjusting the china teacup held in the doll's tiny hand, while the rim of the cup glints in the light which extrudes from the fireplace. If the girl is of a similar age to you, it seems strange that she would content herself by playing with dolls. Perhaps there be only things left that will keep her company. Is she not too old for it? There's no such thing as too old for being love or loving a doll, for goodness sakes. This girl would be more at home, you decide, at a ball, wearing an extravagant gown, speaking with wealthy noblemen, perhaps even princes. She should not be sitting in what you presume is her bedchamber, adjusting a teacup in a doll's hand. We all have our vices of keeping ourselves happy, but you are not afforded much more time to stand there, marveling at a girl, because she turns. She raises her head. Then, her eyes meet yours. You thought the girl pretty when first you observed her. Sitting on the edge of her plush, velveteen bed examining her doll. Now she is looking at you, however. Her face illuminated by the flames in that grate. You can see that you were mistaken. She is not just pretty, she is beautiful. So much so, it is breathtaking. She looks as though she had stepped out of the pages of a pi picture book, sorry. She is simply too perfect to belong to this world. 
Perhaps she has some kind of vision, a waking dream, a hallucination, the wonderful princess that we keep dreaming of. But no, she has none of those things. Aww. But on her lap is a cold hard thing made of porcelain, and it is unflinchingly, reassuringly real. If she were a mirage, surely she would not be able to phys sorry, handle physical objects such as this. It is strange, though. The doll, though immaculately made, looks oddly imperfect when compared to the girl who is holding it. She is so st sorry. She is so startlingly beautiful. She even puts man-made representations of feminine charms to shame. The sight of her makes you feel rather weak. You always have had a fondness for fair maidens, haven't you? Haven't you? You are rather hopeless when it comes to them. Even worse than a knight errant or a courtly legend. Your aesthetic appreciation is not particularly ladylike. But who cares? Well, it is not every day a girl encounters an elegant beauty like this. A teared in red, illuminated, sorry, illuminated by the firelight. I suppose I can forgive you for this rudeness, as too can the girl. She does not seem to be the type to hold a grudge. Oh, the girl says in a voice that, surprisingly enough, far less refined than her appearance. It is good to see you. I've been waiting. Has she? That is news to you. Huh? The only thing I can think of is that blink sound effect. You blink, perplexed, a response on the tip of your tongue, but you are unable to expel it into the, the ether, or the ether. The girl is sitting, so yeah, setting her doll aside. Then she stands, the hem of her dress swishing around her legs. Nimbly like a ballerina, she canvasses the space between you. Her room is so very large, there's quite a lot of space. Then takes your hands in her own. You must, the girl says, her eyes aglow with excitement. Be my new lady's maid. It's been a while, but it's such a relief that you finally arrived. I knew that you would. So what if we took the shore or the um, other route, the village route? What would happen then? Would you be then be disappointed? You never leave me alone. Not when you knew how long I was waiting. Oh, I'm so happy. The girl's good mood is contagious. So much so, you find yourself being swept away in it. You are tempted to accept any identity she might press upon you. You have never been a maid before, but you might not mind being this girl's maid. She does not seem like a poor mistress to serve. Not as she is always this kind. You cannot mask the confusion, however, which flickers across your face. You are not a good enough actress. And in any case, this is all happening too quickly. So sudden. Too sudden. Very suspicious. Why you barely know this girl? Why is she being so very familiar? It is with blank, bovine eyes that you will examine this girl. Your befuddlement is pronounced enough that even the girl, despite her good mood, notices it. She frowns. Then she says, her fingers sliding away from your own. Or am I mistaken? Are you not my new lady's maid after all? The disappointment in the girl's face is abundant, so much so your heart clenches. You do not know her, she is still a stranger, but you are struck all of a sudden with the intense desire to appease her. You do not want to let her down. The thought is devastating. You are not aware. You tell her that you had applied to be her maid, but if that is what she wills, you would not be opposed to it. You pray that she forgives you. Though, for your discombobulation, you come from a distant country and you have travelled for many miles. You know not where you are, or you do not who sorry, do not know who she is. What? You do not know who I am? It is regrettable you tell her, but no. You do not know her though. That is no fault of her own. 
Why? You have spent such a long time running, you hardly even know yourself. Ah, so you are a fugitive then? For another country? I see. I won't pry into your past then if you'd rather forget about it. I don't mind sharing my past with you though. Everybody in this country knows who I am after all, or at least they should. Now, this is quite the impressive boast. If it were to come from the lips of another, you would find it unpleasantly arrogant. You do not think, however, that this girl is trying to show off. You get a feeling instead that she is merely telling the truth. Or at least, your mind is wanting for her to tell the truth. If you don't have the pleasure of knowing me, then allow me to do the honours. My father and my mother were the king and queen of this realm, and I am its princess. So you're saying, were, but they're no longer here. I've lived in this castle all of my life, so I don't know much about the outside world. But I know that other countries do exist out there. I presume it is one of those foreign countries that you come from. It is very good to meet you. I've always wanted to talk to somebody from overseas. It feels like quite the opportunity. <laughs> the girl giggles at this and you smile in response. You tell her unthinkably, King Lee, but it is your pleasure really to meet her. Or at least you mean to. You only get halfway through this remark when the full gravity of what the girl has told you sinks in. You come to a stop. Then you stare. Did she just say she was a princess? Yes, she did. Yes, that's right. I'm a princess and one day I'll be a queen. After I've done a little bit of growing up. My ministers don't think I'm ready to run the country just yet, but I've been doing my best at my lessons. One day I'm sure I'll be the best queen there ever was, says every queen. Or princess, sorry. So she really is a princess. That makes sense, you suppose, given she lives in a castle. But it comes as a surprise, regardless. You wish hard enough that your wish came true, dear protagonist. You hadn't known before you entered this chamber that you were trespassing on a lady of such great renown. Why, if she willed it, she could have you executed for your carelessness at a heartbeat's notice. An ugly red flush creeps up on your face, a flush which is far more lurid than your princess's dress as you look to your feet. Bashful, you stammer out a new address, but you are very sorry for intruding upon her, and you hope that she can forgive you. Oh, it's alright. Think nothing of it. I don't mind, really. We all make mistakes, and anyway, you weren't to know. You said you weren't from around here. You nod your head in silence and fermination. It isn't a complete lie. You really are not from this country. You are not from this world, what the hell? You are not from this world after all. How wonderful. I'll look forward to picking your brains later, which which can be um, psychologically or physically because of the themes of this game. All of my servants come from the nearby village. Their tales are all the same. And so are their superstitions. They are all the same just with a different coat of paint. I could do with a breath of fresh air. My last lady's maid told me that I was too impertious. But I don't think there's anything wrong with wanting a bit of revenge. Exactly. Not that I've ever been afforded much of that. I've been shut up in here for so, so long, I hardly ever get the chance to talk to other girls my age. My last lady's maid was older than me. And so was the one before her. And the one before her. Okay, we get it, okay? All of them have been older than you, personally. Some of the princess's fair mood seems to dissipate as she speaks, her expression turning by degrees into something rather more pensive. But I haven't seen any of my old lady's maids in a while, or any of the other servants for that matter. 
they've all disappeared. Now that is quite curious. How could a whole household full of servants simply disappear? That I don't know. This castle was full of servants once. My lady's maids, and my undermaids, and my soldiery maids, and my housekeeper, and my cooks, and a large routine of retainers. They're all gone now, though. I think my ministers must have sent them away. I don't know why they would have done that, though. They didn't explain it to me. In fact, where the hell are my ministers? But then again, they never explain anything to me. They still treat me like a little girl. It is so tiring. She said that her ministers sent her servants away. What of her parents, the king and the queen? Would they not be the ultimate authorities in the castle's hierarchy? Well, guess what, dear protagonist? You only wished for a fair princess, not for a fair ministers and a fair king and a fair queen or a fair subservient maid or anything like that. They would, yes, if they were still alive, but they're not. They died a long time ago. I was raised for most of my life by my servants. Oh, you answer when you flush. You hadn't known. It's all right, you don't need to apologize. I'm just happy that I have you now. I was getting sick and tired of only having my dolls to speak to. They aren't the best, so they are not the best conversational partners. Yeah, you can imagine so, yeah. You doubt any doll, even one made by a talented artisan with an intelligent face indistinguishable from a human's would be very good at answering back. Oh no, they aren't. They're hopeless at it, really. They're so stony-lipped. You've no idea how much of a relief it is to see you. To see anybody, for that matter. This castle is so big, and without my servants, it feels so very empty. It gets so lonely here. Now, that is an interesting turn of fate. So, pray so. It catches inside your head like a blur. Have you heard it before? You do not have much time to ponder this, however, because the princess is speaking anew in that curiously conversational manner of hers which does not seem particularly princessy. Maybe she learned how to speak from her servants. That would explain why her consultants are so unrefined. Consonants, sorry. Oh, but listen to me yammering on again. It's a bad habit. I really must put a stop to it. You're probably tired, dear one, from your travels. Would you like me to show you to your room? Yes, the princess announces. Before you can say anything in reply, I think I'll do just that. I might show you a bit around the castle first, though. It's like a maze in here, and I wouldn't want you to get lost. You'll be staying here for quite some time, after all. The princess then hastens to take you on a tour of her home. Fortunately, she does not show all of the rooms in her abode, and neither does she offer overly long descriptions as to what the few rooms she does show you are used for, because nobody have the time or patience or the mental capacity to explain it to her. Okay, maybe that last part was a bit mean. She does, however, pause by the kitchens, whereat she offers you some victuals. Once the growling in your belly has been satisfied, the princess then resumes her journey. She leads you down a dark, twisting hallway and up a series of equally dark, twisting steps until she arrives, at long last, at an equally dark and twisting door. The princess pushes this door aside sim similarly, I don't know how to pronounce that word, similarly? thus permitting you entrance to a small, humble bedchamber. This chamber is not half so opulent as the grand bedroom in which the princess resides, with its resplendent four-post and its richly patterned wallpaper. This room's ceiling is not as high, and the singular bed shoved against the wall is thin and narrow. The walls are an unassuming beige, and before, sorry, the floor beneath your soles is of warped wood. There is a 
Maladurst scent too, which hangs in the air. One of disuse and general decay. You get the feeling that nobody has slept in this room for quite some time. That might explain why it feels so very cold in here. Though, if the princess's tour of her castle has taught you anything, is it? Sorry, it is that uh, it is cold in every room in her abode. Now here we are, the final stop of our tour. This will be your room, dear one. I hope it's to your liking. The princess, despite her exalted status, looks somewhat uneasy as she observes you. Her eyes upturned like those of a loyal dog's. Is she concerned about your reaction to this room? Perhaps she is afraid that you will turn her nose up her kindness. For a princess, she is awfully eager to please. This unexpected contrast between the princess's lofty title and her ingratiating attitude makes you smile. The room is rather scanty, yes, but when it comes to its contents, but is more, wait a minute. When it comes to its contents, but it is more than passable. That butt part does not need to be included. It has a roof and four walls, and though it is cold, you fancy you will feel warmer once you have slipped beneath the bed sheets. The room is not quite so fancy as your dormitory at the, that word, and neither is it so large, but it does have one glaring improvement over your previous lodgings. You will not be expected to share it with anybody else. There is only one bed in this room, and this bed is to belong to you. You think that a piece number quiet will do you a world of good. You tell the princess as much as she smiles. That's good. I was worried that you wouldn't like it. <laughs> I know it isn't much to look at, but it is one of the nicest servants' rooms we have in the castle. Most of the maids sleep beneath the roof in this teeny tiny room which is all cramped. There's ten beds up there, and they're so close together, there's barely any room to pass between them. I thought it was perfectly ghastly when I saw it. But last time I went up there, not that I was supposed to go up there, it was a rainy day and I couldn't go outdoors, so I was doing a bit of exploring. If the housekeeper had known I'd been sulking around, I don't think she would have been best pleased exactly, not pleased whatsoever. Well, in any case, nobody sleeps up there anymore. The solo, the sco sorry, the schooly maids are all gone now. I couldn't put you up there though, in the attic, with all those empty beds. I don't think it'd be very cheery. Yeah, it'd be like staying at a hospital with you as the only patient. In a room of empty beds. You're not just a scully maid, you're my lady's maid. That means you deserve good lodgings. It'd be an insult to offer you any less than this. Now it's getting late. You'll have to forgive me for rabbiting on. I prefer rabbiting on than not rabbiting at all. I've heard it's something I tend to do, it's a bad habit. One that's unbecoming for a lady. We don't care. The housekeeper's warned me enough times. You reassure the princess to the contrary, smile as you do so. You do not mind if she talks too much. That is better than not talking at all. Exactly. Her a feeble nature makes it easier to spend time with her. Manners be damned. You are always scolded too back in the conserv conservatory for your behavior. You know full well how aggravated it can be to be unbribed, not for any particular misdemeanor, but for being yourself. Well, I'm glad you understand, the princess answers with a giggle. I really should be off, though. It's bad manners to keep you, especially when you look so sleepy. Get some rest. We could talk more tomorrow, if tomorrow ever comes. If you don't mind my careless prattle, I'm glad you seem to appreciate it, at least. Though I'm sure you'll get tired of it eventually. All of my old maids did. <laughs> the princess departs, and in her absence, you take a seat upon the bed. Your new bed. You cannot help but think that this is all happening very quickly. A bit too quickly. What if this princess is somehow attracted to us, and then we'll become, I don't know, a victim in this castle? 
because we will never be able to leave the castle because the princess wants us here forever and ever. It does not seem like a very long, sorry, like very long ago that you were still in the forest, running for your life. A monster were tall, imposing trees with their gnarled, grasping branches. The forest might as well be a distant memory now, though. You are indoors, inside a castle, no less. And you have been given a room in which to sleep and clothes that you might wear. It seems premature still to declare that you are out of the woods. In a metaphorical sense, yeah, we are still kind of in the woods. I mean, but things can certainly be worse. You force yourself to stand on legs which feel too weary to support you and change into the night clothes hanging in the wardrobe. The night clothes do not fit you perfectly, but you are too tired to care about that. You are too tired to care about much of anything. You retreat to a bed and slide beneath its sheets. Then you let your eyelids fall shut. You exhale. And lulled by the breeze which blows outdoors, you fell asleep. You are so very tired. Your sleep is... Sorry, your sleep is a dark... Sorry, a deep dark one. Darker even than the furthest abysses of the night time. Like the nighttime sky, however, which simmers with stars, your sleep is not devoid of those primsatic fragments you humans call dreams. So you are not human after all, protagonist. But that doesn't matter. Though in this case, I rather think your nocturnal imaginings are worth more. So worth more and more than that. They are not dreams, are they? To which your slumbering mind is subjected? You know that they are not, otherwise your body would not be so very cold, not so clammy. The images that flicker beneath your closed eyelids, like the ghostly images in a, fi a phenastocatic scope, were not conjured from within your mind. They were instead taken from your memories. You are not merely dreaming, you are remembering. You remember the girls who slept in your dormitory and how they always hastened to use the shower first so you were last for breakfast, then scolded you because you were the slowest one to get yourself ready. You remember how when you finally did arrive at a dining hall, the most desirable morsels have already been snuffled up by the girls who got there earlier. You struggled to, to find a seat. Once you finally did get your hands on some food, because nobody ever wanted to sit with you. The other girls will act as like you were a leper, save for when they wanted flavors. They never asked for these flavors, mind. For why would they? To them, your father's privilege did not matter. They were all wealthy ladies too, many of them wealthier than you. When everybody has the airs and graces of the princess, how is anybody supposed to stand out? You stood out the least in your class, perhaps because you were one of the smallest, the frailest, the sickliest, who always came down with cold in winter. Your poor health did not stop the other girls from treating you as a servant, though, when they remembered that you existed, of course. It was your lot in life, your spawn as you dwelt within the stone walls of the conservatory to carry school bags across the field like a pack mule. Then, come the evenings, the girls in your dormitory had you sewing on missing buttons and iron out creases and wrinkles in their uniforms. If there was an odd job that needed performing, you would always be asked. But these girls did not ask you. That would have been too civilized. They ordered you instead, and as they ordered you, they laughed at you. They laughed and they laughed and they laughed. The laughter hurt, but it hurt considerably less than, it, than the kicks did, and the slaps, and the pinches. Once during an embroidery lesson, one of your classmates had an accident with her sewing scissors. She stumbled, or at least she pretended to. And before you knew it, the silvery blades of those scissors were embedded in your left palm. 
This happened quite some time ago, when you were even littler than you are now, but you can still remember it. It hurt a lot. The scissors were sharp, and they perforated your skin. Not all the way down to a bone, but enough to bleed. Your wound bled bright red like strawberry jam all over your bordery. Then when your professor saw it, she shrieked. Her face turned as pale as well they sh when she <laughs> and she looked for a few moments, as though she might faint. But you were the one who was in pain. Your professor looked at you. She could not bear to look at your hand. Then demanded to know why you could not be more careful. Hey, for goodness sakes, this is not our fault. Someone stumbled with those scissors towards us. Her tone had been an accusatory one. Almost as if you had been stabbed yourself in the hand with your scissors to go to her. The pain in your hand hurt, but the giggles of your persecutors hurt all the more. They never were punished for that. Perhaps your professor did not care enough to punish them. Perhaps she, like everybody else, thought it was all your fault. The wound, when all, said, when all was said was done, was not too deep. You do not even have any stitches. It healed well enough in time, on its own. But it still left a scar. A white, raised fiend like a crescent moon. You still have that scar. You do not know how much blood you lost. It seemed like a lot back in the classroom. You can still sm you so you could smell it in the air, sharp as iron. But it could not have been that much, evidently, because you are still alive. If your wound had been more serious, perhaps your professor might have cared. Perhaps your classmates too would have felt some modicum of guilt over what they did. But this seems very unlikely. You know that your blood meant nothing to your classmates. Why should it? If you meant next to nothing, then the blood in your veins was, if such a thing was possible, even more inconsequential. You felt disoriented when you awake, at long last with the rising of the sun. You do not remember what you dreamt, but you do not think that your dreams were of a particularly pleasant nature. If they were, your heart would not be hammering so. Ah, so ill at ease, you glance around. You are lying in a narrow bed in an unremarkable room, one with dull beige walls and a warped wooden floor. Where exactly are you? This does not look like the dormitory in the conservatory, not unless it has shrunk threefold overnight. Your, bo so your, your brow furrows as you attempt to recall the events of the night prior, until with a gasp it all clicks into place. You remember now. You are running through the woods, trying to escape from... You shudder. You do not want to think of what it was you were trying to escape from. You presume that you must have given your hunter the slip, though, because you are still in one piece, awake and alert enough to face the dawning of a new morning. You still have all of your limbs, and your facial features appear to be in the correct configuration. <laughs> that is more than enough to be getting along with. You look to the front of your bed, then blink, bemused at your discovery. You can see, lying upon the sheets, a garment, two garments, actually, of black and white folded into a neat white square. What could that be? A maid's outfit? If so, it would not be too surprising. You can now recall your visit with the princess the night prior, and her assertions that you must be her lady's maid. Well, if as for all she wants you to assume, you have no qualms with it. It is far preferable to the other role you played last night, that of a startled quarry running from its pursuer. You press your fingers against the humble maid a tear, it feels surprisingly soft to the touch, not coarse like you expected. These clothes are rather fine. Did the princess put them here? If so, that is all the more reason to wear them. You are not clearish enough to deny her hospitality. You rise from your new bed, but undress yourself, unbuttoning the front of your plain white nightgown and setting it aside. This task accomplished. You then clad yourself in your newer tier, black, white, and inanimately sensible. 
You feel very far away from the girl that you were once were. Your face might be the same as always. But something within you seems to have changed. You are no longer a student. Not as long as you mean to reside within the princess's castle. You would far rather be her servant. Assured of your newfound identity, you retreat from your chamber, then make your way to your mistress's bedroom. There's a lot in the artwork which is missing out when you're only within the UI. The castle is a large one with many, many rooms and many, many hallways with many, many possibilities to connect them. And for a brief while, you find yourself horrendously lost. You cannot remember where the princess's bedroom is. You are beginning to feel rather disoriented when, to your relief, your eyes snag upon a stairwell which looks rather familiar. Could this be the way? You ascend these steps. Your foot falls, cushioned by the plush carpet which lines them. Then find your way down the very same hall you traversed the night prior. If your memory does not fail you, then the princess's bedroom ought to be... Yes, it is here. You rap upon the door, but receive nothing in the way of a response. Is the princess to the bed? You wonder briefly whether you oughtn't to wait until she has risen of her own accord. But no, the sun is high in the sky, and it would seem a shame to let the princess sleep through the day. You ought instead to ruse her. That seems like the sort of duty a lady's maid should attend to. You enter the princess's bedroom and glance about, but there is no princess in the bed. Her room looks much the same as you remember it from the night prior, though the scenes seem even higher when viewed in the one morning's light. You see, you sorry, you can see now that there are fewer shadows to impede your view. How very ointment your young mistress's abode is. Her armory is large and imposing, as is the grace in which you will be expected to keep a fire lit during the night. The princess herself, meanwhile, is curled in a sigh beneath the sheets, looking rather less grandiose than her title would suggest. She is a tiered in a nightgown adorned with frills, and her hair is split across her pillow like spilled gold. In her slender arms, meanwhile, held to her chest, is a doll, the very same one she was cosseting last night. You suppose this doll must be her favourite? I do wonder what the doll's name is, though you do not suppose it matters all that much. It is time to wake your mistress. You call out to the princess, but she is largely unresponsive. Her eyelashes are still sewn tightly shut and her lips purse in slumber. You purse your lips too and sigh. Well, nobody ever said your job would be easy. Once again, you call to a princess and this time she replies. Her response is not a favorable one, however. <sighs> she sighs, just turns away from you, a doll clutch to her chest. Just give me a little longer. I don't want to go to school today. I just want to stay home and bake cookies with you. The princess sounds so enfeebled that you do not take pity on her. If you had learned anything from the conservatory, say for knowledge pertaining to the respi respiratory traits of fish, it is that one must be cruel to be kind. You do not think this ad age was practiced with any great success in the conservatory, but perhaps it would have more of an impact upon the princess. You tell her once again to wake up, more sternly this time. You will not let her sleep, for she has slept long enough already. You don't know what time she went to bed. It is very sovereignly, really, to still be in bed at such an hour. Oh, defeated. The princess sighs. All right, I can see that. I cannot twist you around in my... <laughs> can I twist you around my little finger? I'm up, I'm up. You don't need to nag me. Once you have ruined the princess from her bed and you have put her doll to one side, you set up her toilet tea. You aid the princess in the brushing of her hair, a chore to which she submits willingly, like a cat might allow its fur to be brushed. 
You allow yourself to ponder as you run the bristles of the princess's brush sorry, through her hair. How wonderfully soft it feels against your skin. There's a curious query from the princess. Are you alright, dear one? Brings you back to your senses. You are rather lost in thought there. Look lively now. You wouldn't want the princess to catch wind of your... Sanctress thoughts, would you? I thought that you had learnt your lesson about that already. Suitably chastened, you finish with the princess's hair, then set the brush aside. Now that the princess's tresses have been taken care of, you must start her a tear. The princess remains seated upon the edge of her bed, looking up at your askance. She does not ask you to avert your eyes, and nor does she make any motion of divesting herself on her nightgown. It really does seem as though she expects you to undertake this task of your own. On your own, sorry. Is that alright? You ask the princess much, you wish you would you would not wish to impringe upon her modesty, but she only laughs. Yes, that's alright. It's what you're supposed to do if you were to be my lady's maid. I'm used to being dressed and undressed. I'm not a bit squeamish about it. She might not be squeamish about it, but you are. You have never seen a naked woman before expecting yourself. Even then, however, you have always dressed and undressed furtively, not once to examine your body for longer than it's strictly necessary. <laughs> you have never much liked the way that you look. You make a few more mumbled objections, but the princess sweeps them to one side easily. It's alright, I might be a princess, but we're both people underneath all of our clothes. I doubt we look much different. You are not sure about that. You have not yet seen the princess unadorned, but you already know to look at her face that you are different. She is much, much prettier than you are, but she is waiting, and you do not wish to keep her waiting any longer. Because that would be rude to keep a princess waiting. You steady your nerves. Then you reach out with trembling hands. And you begin to undo the buttons which runs down the front of the princess's nightgown. You work as quickly as you are able. Which, given how badly your hands are shaking, is not very. You fumble with a couple of the buttons, flinching as you do so. The princess, however, seems blissfully unaware of what it is exactly you are doing. Or not doing, for your fingers have begun to seize up with the front of her nightgown. She is not even looking at you. Instead, her gaze is directed beyond your shoulder to the windowsill and the sky beyond it. It isn't particularly sunny, but I don't think it's too cold outside. Going for a walk might not be a bad idea. What do you think, dear one? You think that you would like to finish undressing the princess as soon as possible so that you can make some progress on dressing her again. The sight of all of this exposed skin is bad for your heart. Fortunately, you are able to make quick work of the princess's nightgown despite your initial mishaps. Spurred on perhaps by your anxiety, you bid the princess to stand. Which she does, and neatly she steps out of her nightgown, her motions once again as graceful as she fluid as a dancer. This task completed, you search hurriedly, worriedly for the princess's red dress. Where is it? You cannot find it. Sweat begins to prickle on the back of your neck. Your palms, meanwhile, feel uncomfortably clammy. The moments pass awkwardly, uneasily, as you search. The princess standing there, all the while as naked as the day she was born. Why did you not find her day dress before you stripped her of her night one? What a fool you are. The princess notices your panic giggles, then says, Are you looking for my dress? Yes, you reply, your face flush. That is what you were doing. I thought so. I did wonder before you started undressing me. Why you not ask where it was? Maybe it slipped your mind? It has slipped your mind, yes, to your shame. You were too busy trying not to fix it upon the princess's bared skin to think about how to best conceal it. My dress is in my armory, the princess says, glancing over to the aforeminated 
piece of furniture. That army of hers is an extricately carved wooden structure, large enough, or say you ex you estimate, to fit inside it. So yeah, to fit inside it, inside it. In oh gosh, I keep mucking up the centers. To fit inside it enough dresses to a tear a whole ballroom's worth of princesses. I'd like to wear the red one. It's my favorite. Would you be a dear and fetch it for me? I don't want to rush you, but it is rather cold in here, especially when I'm still naked. She raised a good point. You turn away from the princess and make your way to her armory. Once there, you open its wooden doors and peruse the clothes hanging within. It is just as you expected. Inside that wardrobe lies numerous dresses, all of them finely sewn and decorated with no shortage of ribbons, lace, and irresident pearls. You find the princess's red dress soon enough, then hurry to her side. With your spores in hand, you hurry to dress her, concealing, once again, the princess's pale skin beneath layers upon layers of soft red velvet. She is easier to look at now, you think, with her skin concealed. There might be the most nerve-wracking task you have ever had to accomplish, even more so than your pearliest escape through the foggy forest. Why? It seems a small miracle you can still remember how to breathe. Ah, <laughs> that's much better. Thank you, dear one, for your help. You've not been here for a full day, but I already wonder what I'd do without you. Surely you're sure a princess that you did nothing, really. Nothing beyond your job. You did not do anything incredible. And in any case, being complimented by someone so pretty is embarrassing. Aw, don't be like that. I want to compliment you. Why shouldn't I? When you've been so helpful, it'd be rude not to. And anyway, I think you're very pretty too. Oh my. Your face flushes from this more deeply than ever before. You ought to count yourself lucky, really, with what's all this ex excessive blushing. Then the princess does not seem to possess any vampiritist that tendency sorry i know how to pronounce that word but it just won't come out you are making yourself quite the easy target now the princess declares why don't we go for a walk it's a nice enough day and i get so very bored of being cooped up inside you can't think of any particular objections to raise to this remark and you think that the princess might have a point the castle though expensive is somewhat stifling the walls are so very thick, they put you in mind of a crypt. Crypt. With your acquaintances assured, the princess quits her chamber, her posture elegant and her gait unhurried. She seems not to walk as she navigates her way through the seamlessly endless hallways of her home, but to float like a cloud. The hem of her dress swishes around her legs, and her hair shifts like a shroud. The castle's courtyard, meanwhile, is sadly lacking in comparison to the princess's beauty. Wherever the princess goes, flowers will grow. The courtyard is fenced in by the castle's walls, which look in the stark midday light, tall and imposing, face the soldiers standing sentinel. Though the sun is out, it is not particularly bright, and neither is it particularly warm. The courtyard itself, meanwhile, is in a state of disarray. The flower beds are in shambles, all overgrown with weeds. It is all rather depressing. The princess's castle might be grand in scale, but the courtyard itself is simple, hemmed into a claustrophobic degree, like a coffin. The princess, however, seems not to share your delirious mood. She instead looks elated by the newfound surroundings, her smile unwavering. She gambles around like a lamb, flitting hither and hither as she examines the weed-infested flower beds. Her frolicking comes to a cease, however, by a bush. One is full of bright red ones. Oh, how very pretty! Do you not think they are gorgeous, dear one? The flowers are not too disappointing, you suppose? 
they make for a fine spectacle. In fact, a welcome splash of colour when contrasted with the dullness and the drabness which permeates the rest of the courtyard. There's one pretty flower though. Though the other flowers in their beds are wilted, withered things, it is not so for these roses. They are a rich bright red, just like blood. Their heads so full they seem almost too droop to, sorry, beneath the weight of their own engorged petals. They are pretty in a sense, but there is something unsettling about them too. Something that's almost obscene. How do these roses become so very red? The blood of all of the princess's victims. That is what powers their redness. What has been sustaining them? Could it be possible that these roses have been draining the life force from the other flowers which are struggling to grow within this garden? It is a fanfical thought, though. But... Oh, they are simply divine. Look at these roses. Always lifts my spirits. They really are my most favorite flowers. I simply must pick some of them. Perhaps I can use them to decorate my bedchamber. It could use a bit of color. Guess what? They will wilt over time. The princess reaches out so as to pluck one of the roses free from its resting place among its brethren. You watch her, your breath baited, anxious that this gesture might result in performinated flesh and bright red blood. But the princess is not as clumsy as you fear. Of course she is not. Who do you think she was? You? Rather than worrying about other people, you would be better served as you were so it served if you were worried more about yourself. The princess holds her newly plethoric rose to her nose and inhales. Her eyelids falling shut as the flower's sweet scent washes over her. A few moments later, silence pass. Then the princess begins to toy with her petals which adorn the flower's crown. She loves me. She loves me not. She loves me. She loves me not. She loves me. She loves me not. And all the while, petals always have an odd amount of them on a flower. Now, let me see. I wonder what fate has in store for- Oh my god! <laughs> Why did I predict this? <laughs> the princess plucks a petal from the flower's overburdened head. She loves me not. The princess continues with this childish incantation all the while stripping her rose slowly and methodically of its petals. These petals flutter about the princess like bloody snow, except it's red snow. The princess's voice, meanwhile, echoes through the courtyard, even more melodic, sorry, even more melodic than the strains of a piñala. She loves me. She loves me not. She loves me. She loves me not. The princess's fingers hover over the final petal which crowns her nearly denied flower. Then with a triumphant smile she declares, She loves me! I knew it! You watch the princess amused by her girlish good cheer. The little man first she has been residing is one that you are familiar with. The girls at the conservat conservatory also used to engage in this little game, the younger ones at least who believed that a fairy tale prince would whisk them away, but he did not say he loves me, he loves me not. You might have participated in this game yourself when you were a child yourself, but you never pinned your hopes and dreams on a handsome prince. Your interest in princes has always been minimal. When it comes to fair princesses, though, or oh, that is an entirely different ball game. Well, that is a different matter altogether, isn't it? Pleasantly, you ask the princess whose love it is she wishes to court, a query which makes the princess giggle. Why you, of course? Oh, dear one, who else would I be thinking of? Naturally, I was thinking of you. Naturally? She says it's so easy as well, you ought to be a suspect as much, and indeed part of you did. You wanted to believe, yet part of you was afraid to. 
You do not want to be arrogant enough to assume that a princess might care for your affections. You begin to blush, your cheeks almost as red as roses, while the princess laughs. She laughs and she laughs and she laughs, her voice clear and sweet like a nightingale's song as though you are the funniest thing she has ever seen. You never liked being laughed at when you dwelt within the walls of the conservatory, but it is different with her. It's coming from different intentions. You have not known her for all that long, but you are already entranced by her, ensnared. She has you wrapped around her little pinky. Oh my. The princess's laughter tapers off into a series of giggles as, smiling, she wipes her eyes with the back of her hand. That was quite the amusing diversion, but I've just had an idea. You look at the princess curiously. What idea? You can't tell? You can't even begin to guess. I just thought all this watching must be boring you, the princess says, tossing the rose's stripped stem carelessly to the ground. You should give her a try. Please do, it'll be fun. The princess retrieves a second red rose from the bushes, daftly snapping it between her fingers and offers it to you. I want to see what fate has in store for you. Guess what? All these petals have an odd number of them, so the first one that happens always is the one that ends. You smile, a princess touched by her enthusiasm. Indulge, sorry, indulging childish games like this might not be the best use of your time, but the princess looks so very determined you would not wish to hurt her. What could the harm be, really? Except killing the flower. In consulting? The only real causality of this game would be one singular rose. The rose that the princess is holding towards you. You reach out, mean to accept the princess's offering, but... Oh no! You are clumsy and you seize the stem of the rose with a touch too much strength. The head of a rose might be pretty, but there is more to the rose than its bright red flowers. Yeah, there's a blot of red! Roses have thorns too. A fact you are now being painfully reminded of. Pain flares through your fingers as, and, and you gasp. You take a step back, the hem of your skirt swishing around your ankles. Your finger is stinging, and so are your eyes. You ought to have been more careful. Why were you not why were you so stupid? You poor dear, you're bleeding! The princess examines, alarmed. Then she frowns. This is all my fault. If I had not suggested a silly game, this never would have happened. Please, let me take care of you. And how is she going to do that? Perhaps she means to take a handkerchief from her pocket, which she might have staunch your wound. Princesses tend to carry handkerchiefs around with them. Don't they? Silken ones? Yeah, they're expensive as well. How else would they have give brave knights tokens of their gratitude? Once those fulminated knights have successfully slain dragons, princesses can hardly dispense kisses as favors as simply is not done. That is what you've always thought, but... Please hold still, this might sting a little bit. This princess is anything but ordinary. Rather than take a handkerchief out of her pocket, she instead enclose her white slender fingers around your hand. Carefully, as though she is handling a precious object, she raises your hand, her eyes are fixed, all the while on the beads of stars and need crimson blood which are oozing lucratively from your wound. She licks her lower lip. Then she dips her head. Oh? Okay, so that's what we look like then, the one on the left. She parts her mouth, and with a soft sigh, which borders on the sensuous, she slips your injured digit between her teeth. Her teeth. Her teeth! So much for princesses not dispensing kisses as tokens of appreciation. It's not, this might not be a conventional kiss, but feels intimate regardless. Almost strikingly so. The princess's lips, which are as rosy as any rose, are enclosed around your index finger. You can feel the warmth of the princess's mouth around, sorry, about your skin, and the wetness of it. These sensations make your whole body quake. You did not expect this. Tremulously, in a voice which wavers, you ask the princess what is she doing. Oh? The princess glanced up at you, her mouth still enclosed around your finger. Didn't I tell you? I'm trying to stop the bleeding. 
Yes, you gathered as much, but... Is there a problem? I'm not making you uncomfortable, am I? It's not you say that she is making you uncomfortable per se, but this is rather awkward. You did not expect it, that is all. And is she not worried that this is unhygienic? Unhygienic? The princess blinks. She is the very picture of innocence, which is funny, really, given your finger still nestled against her tongue. I don't know what you mean by that exactly, but I've heard this is the best way to take care of cuts. My nursemaid used to do this for me when I was a child. It's what you're supposed to do. And you ask, your voice catching in your throat, did her nursemaid keep staunching her wounds with her mouth when she grew older? Well, no, but my nursemaid was dismissed when I was eight years old. That's the normal way of things. I had my lady's maid to look after me then. How very interesting. And did they ever clean her wounds like this? No, the princess says, smiling mischievously, because I'm not clumsy enough to cut myself silly. Hey! Now, that was quite a sharp retort. You did not expect it. Your face turns even redder. If such a thing is possible, though, we could end up looking like an a eggplant. No, a beetroot. Though this might perhaps be to your benefit. With some luck, all of your blood wouldn't follow to your face rather than to your finger and your bleeding will stop. Has it stopped? Your injury was not a deep one. There should be no need for the princess to keep on suckling. But she still is. You are not accustomed to intimacy of this nature. It is making your heart flutter. If the princess knew what her mouth was doing to you, you are sure she would not be so very familiar. You feel quietly, crushingly confident that she would scorn you for your feelings and deem them unnatural. It would not be the first time. At this point, you should be used to rejection. It still stings, though. It stings so much, much more than any thorn on any roads ever could. The days pass. Following your misadventures in the Rose Garden in a relaxed, unhurried sort of a manner. Your mad dash through the forest is beginning to feel like a distant memory. So much so that you can scarcely recall the raw naked fear you once felt as you fled for your life. There is no running to be had, so I had so, while you are working for the princess. You would have nowhere else to run, and in any event, there is no longer any reason to run. The shadows which once tormented you have, at long last, begun to recede. You can scarcely recall as you lay down in your bed the petty cruelties that you were subjected to by your classmates at the conservatory. They no longer matter. Your attention is focused not upon yourself but upon the princess. The more time you spend with her, the more you come to care for her. You have become quite besotted with her, but you are yet to realize it. Well, I never... How very ignorant can one girl be for her own feelings? The princess is not half so ignorant as you are, though, despite having spent her whole life within the palace's walls. The weight of her own feelings are not unknown to her, and during one stormy night she chooses to make them known to you. You are in the princess's chambers later. Perhaps then you ought to be later in the... Sorry, Van is strictly appropriate. It is dark outside, and there is little save the moonlight of sorry, the light of the moon to eviate it. That and the fire which crackles in the grate. You have only just finished stoking that very fire, and now you raise. You look to a princess who is lying in her bed, and you bid her a good night, as you have many nights before. With a neat curtsy, you turn to leave, but the princess is plaintive voice gives you pause. Wait, dear one, do not go. Not just yet. Perplexed, you pause, then look back at the princess. Though she is smiling, her expression is unusually wan. Is she alright? Oh, I'm sure I'll be fine. It's just nice like this, you know, which makes me feel a little out of sorts. And what, you ask, does she mean by that? Only that it is very cold and very dark. And it is very windy besides. I'm afraid there will be a storm later. It was awfully cloudy earlier. We went out for a walk on our own. 
The princess is not mistaken about that. The sky when the pair you promenaded about the gardens earlier was grey and steely, the wind bitingly cold. You can hear the wind rattling mournfully against the panes in the princess's bedchamber. The princess's sorry, princess's castle is built of stone and it is well fortified, but even with a fire it is rather cold. You do not like to think how much chillier by comparison it will be in your humble bedchamber, which is not fortunate for, sorry, fortunate enough to have its own fireplace. It might sound childish, but I've always found it hard to sleep on stormy nights like this. They make me feel uncomfortable. You look at the princess with no small degree of sympathy. No longer clad in a bright red dress, she looks oddly uncommonly vulnerable. Will she really be alright, all alone in her oversized bed in her high ceilinged bedchamber? You know it is silly of you to contemplate such a query. Why would she not be alright? There is nobody in the castle to hurt her, but still you fret for her. As her lady's maid, it is your job to fret for her. You would never want to... You never want your mistress to feel unhappy. You ask the princess what it is that she would have you do. And the princess perks up at this. Please, perhaps you are taking the initiative. I wouldn't like to take up too much of your time, so... So when it is so very late. But would you mind sitting with me a little while longer and reading to me? Provided that you can, of course. This is a fair enough question, but your pride bristles regardless. Hey, so you reassure the princess that yes, of course you could read. You were a poor student in many aspects of the conservatory, but you had something of a gift when it came to the literacy arts. Reading books is all you have ever been any good at. Hey, that's not true. Oh, I see. I suppose I should have known. You're so incredible. I sometimes wonder if there's anything you can't do. <laughs> The princess's high praise make you flush. Awkwardly, you look away. Being able to read, you reassure her, is not such a great feat. Perhaps it isn't when you hail from, but it is here very few of my old servants could read, and they certainly couldn't read the books that I like. This piques your interest. Intrigued, you ask the princess what books exactly she likes. Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm fond of fairy tales, you see. Old ones from centuries past. I have a collection of them here, the princess says, indicating a book on her bedside table as thick as a mortary slab. The book is old, though, and the bindings are weak. The page is brittle, the writing woefully old-fashioned. I don't trust any of my past servants with that book. But I think you would do a good job breathing life into those old stories. Would you mind reading for me for just a brief while? Please, dear one. Oh, please. The princess's request seems a simple one expressed so sweetly. So much so that you see no reason to refuse her. You take a seat beside the princess upon a luxurious bed which sinks beneath your weight. Then you... So, then you... Then retrieve the leather-bound book which is resting upon her bedside and spread it open. The pages of the books are very brittle, like the princess says, and the bindings of a book are loose. You can feel in the heft of the book's manifold pages the weight of the ages concealed within it. How old is this book? Perhaps it is as old as the castle in which it resides. It is with a quiet voice hesitant at first, but you begin to read to the princess. A tale of courtly love with calamities and a lavish wedding ceremony. All the while as you read, the princess listens to you, enraptured, painting, or so it seems, upon your every word. Once you reach the final phase, embows upon the pages of this aged tome, and they live happily ever after. The princess sighs as though this tale had touched her very soul. Would that there was a handsome prince to marry me, she says somberly. Or better yet, a beautiful princess at this point. 
I think I would even settle for a lowly salary maid. You blush at this idle remark and mumble softly that this would not be proper. The storm outside is still squally, and you have never been one to raise your voice. You do not expect, therefore, that the princess would overhear you, but she does. She observes you, her head resting against her pillows, and says, And what would be the problem with that? Hmm. As my maid, shouldn't my happiness come before any silly ideas of propriety? Well, of course, you reply, but for a princess to marry a solitary maid. You're still hung up about that, the princess tilters. Don't pay it too much heed, I'm just talking to myself. As if anything like that would ever happen, when there is no priest around who would officiate it. You think there are greater issues with the princess's plans but the lack of a priest, though she does present a good point. The castle is an empty one. Even if the princess were to find somebody that she loves, there would be nobody to make such a wedding official. You cannot help but feel like you have avoided a good deal of nuisance. But by the same token, do you not feel a touch disappointed? Well, never mind. That was a nice story. The princess says, but I'm not sleepy yet, and it's still storming outside. Won't you read me one more? You will not mind, you reply, but it is getting late. You really ought to return to your own chamber. I know, but you can't find in your heart to read one story to me. Just one. You can choose a short one. I won't complain. You have some doubts about that, but as before, you cannot resist the princess's demands. It is not, you think, because she is a princess, though that is, of course, a part of it, but because she is, well, radiant. You would not, you think, as you turn to the next story recounted in this aged con compendium, compendium want to upset her. You would rather cut your own tongue. <laughs> Damn. You read another story to a princess, which is of a similar vein to the last. Impossible adventures culminating as they are close in a happy marriage. This tale delights the princess just as much as the tale you read prior as she begs for another, then another. One bedroom story soon becomes five, and even then, when the candles which flicker on the princess's bedside are close to gluttering up, the princess is not satisfied. Like a grasping, greedy child, she has never heard of moderation. When she wants something, she seeks to glut herself with it. Her only request is that of more. If she were less calmly, perhaps her inability to adhere to the word no would have been seen as a character defect. <laughs> the princess is very calmly, however, and so when she makes a nest request, you almost agree offhand without considering her sober ramifications. I think I could go to sleep now, but the storm is still raging. I feel lonely on my own in this big empty bed, so... I know, but Princess's eyes light up in the night sky in a thunderstorm. Why don't you sleep with me? You stare at the Princess, your eyes wide as goose eggs. Slowly you blink. Then, just as slowly you bid her to repeat herself. Didn't you hear me? The Princess cake goes, Maybe you've been so busy cleaning up after me, you've neglected to clean out your own ears. Damn. I said, dear one, would you like to sleep with me? If that is a question she truly means to ask, then it is easy enough to answer. Of course you would like to sleep with her, it would be an honor. But would it really be alright for you to accept such a request, an invitation? It must be a gross breach of protocol, surely, for a lowly domestic such as yourself to share a bed with the princess. You sit upon the princess's bedside fretting while she observes with wide beseeching eyes. She is waiting. Well, what's the matter, dear one? Why do you tarry so? Could it be... The princess's lower lip begins to tremble. Don't you want to lie with me after all? The sorrow present in the princess's voice and her face makes you feel awfully guilty. Only you console her. You tell her in no, in no uncertain terms, but if she truly wishes to partake of your company, then you have no qualms with it. Why would you? Well then, don't just stand there dilly-dallying, silly. Come and join me. Come. 
and that is what you do after returning briefly to your own chamber to change into a, your own your nightgown. <laughs> Once dressed, you waste no time returning to your impudious princess's side. She has already lined her so glorious four boast post a bed awaiting your return as though you were a knight errant gone away to slay some wicked dragon. The princess giggles when she sees you. In your haste to change, you have made a hush of the buttons, and she bids you to come closer. Let me fix that for you, silly. Oh no, you said, I can possibly let you do that. I am but a servant after all. Should it not be your job to dress her? Maybe so, the princess says, but I don't mind a bit of roll with her, so it makes things more fun. <laughs> You try a few more with plantations, but in vain, the princess similarly discards all of them. Quite at a pr princess's mercy, she might be even more stubborn than you are. You capitulate to her demands. You let the princess unbutton the front of your dress, sorry, night dress, then rebutton them, so the fabric of your palm gown is drawn shut. Drawn shut. Satisfied with her handiwork, she has very elegant hands. The princess draws back and pats the mattress beside her. Now, come inside. It must be horribly cold out there. The these sheets are warm. Coily, the princess smiles. And so am I. You feel warm yourself as you slide into bed beside the princess. Your face is as red as the gown the princess so often wears, as red as the roses in the castle's grounds. All the while your heart is fluttering. Does the princess know what an effect she is having on you? Surely she must. How could any woman be so blind? There, the princess exclaims once your body is lying beside hers. That is much better. Do you feel cozy now, dear one? You swallow and, with a shaky voice, you reassure her. Yes, you are cozy. You are quite cozy indeed. Very good. The storm might be raging outdoors, but it can't get us here. I know. When I'm with you, I'll be safe. It's strange, but the princess reaches out, then takes your hand in hers, twining your fingers together like a chain. When I'm with you, I feel so very light. It's as though nothing in the world can hurt me. You make me feel safe, so I want to make you feel safe too. I'll take very, very good care of you. I promise. You return her smile with one of your own, touched by her thoughtfulness. Though something about her promise does make you wonder. Should it not be your job to look after her as a domestic? As she says, she doesn't mind a bit of role reversal. In a way, the princess replies after a pause, but you've been taking good care of me already. Now I need to return the favor. As a princess, I'm supposed to look after my vassals. It's all part of the job description. <laughs> you were unaware that being a princess came with a job description. You thought the profession came with far fewer written responsibilities and far fewer forms to sign than, say, becoming a doctor or an astrophysicist or a mathematics professor. You don't have a princess a bit sleepily as she laughs. You do say some funny things, dear one. I think you must be tired. Rest your head. You've been working so, so hard. I think you deserve it. Yes, you think. Only half conscious. You think you deserve it too. You've been working hard for a long time. Have you been running for even longer? But now, at long last, you feel like you can let your fears go. Your eyelids begin to droop. Your body beleaguered by a sudden, all-consuming fatigue. And in a quiet, understated sort of way, your consciousness is conveyed to the Morpheus's kingdom. Your sleep is a deep one, despite the storm which rages outdoors. The wind is howling like a couple of wild cats, both locked in a vicious and bloodthirsty bout to the death. But you do not hear it. Swaddled by the warm blankets about you, and soothed by the princess's presence, presence, I was about to say precious. <laughs> you are immune from all the ills of the world. When you are with a princess, you feel safe, secure, and yes, you even feel loved.
It is a pity, then, that these feelings do not last for very long. What? You know that something is wrong. Catastrophically so. The moment you open your eyes, your thoughts are hopelessly jumbled, but you're certain that when you fell asleep was in a bed, a nice warm bed, no less beneath a soft, comfortable sheet. You are not lying in a bed right now, though. You are not, in fact, lying at all. Oh, no. You are standing instead against a cold, hard wall made of stone. Gosh, what is this now? The curve of your back is pressed against the wall so intimately you can feel its icy chill seeping through the fabric of your nightgown. Your feet, which are bare, are similarly pressed against cold, unfeeling stone. They feel so frigid you cannot help but tremble. You are trembling so much you can feel your teeth chattering together. They sound like castanets. The sound is almost jaunty as it echoes through your cell. For that is indeed where you are, in a cell, with others. But you're the only one that's alive. The princess's bedchamber, wherein you fell asleep as a thing, now of the past. You are standing instead. You realize with a sharp start in the cell some great underground dungeon. You swallow, and when you do, you can taste something bitter on your tongue. Your stomach is beginning to churn with anxiety. You feel like you're going to be sick. A feeling which wells up inside you to a staggering degree. When you catch notice of the stench, you are not, you realize, the only one in the dungeon. There are others here. Others are tiered in the simple black and white outfits of servants which look much like the dress that you were once you once wore. The others who are with you, however, in this expansive cell, manicured to the walls, are in no fit state to speak to you, nor to tell you of their plight. They are all unfeeling, unsealing, unbreathing. They are all dead. You cannot approach these servants to check their pulses, for you yourself are restrained. Even if you could, there would be no point. There is no way any human could survive the wounds which have been inflicted upon those sad slumped bodies. Over there you see a woman slumped, the front of her once white apron stained with blackish blood. There is a gaping wound in her stomach, one though which her entries have hard as so half escaped, and some sort of burgundy gulp which might once have been pale pink. There's another woman, slumped beside the first of a smaller statue. Statue, sorry. She is skinnier. Maybe she's not a woman after all, but an adolescent like yourself. She might even be younger. The girl's age, or lack of, did not preclude her attacker from inflicting upon her horrors. Alas, for her body is even more mutilated than the first. Her body is peppered with even more wills, and her face has been half smashed in. Only one eye remains, staring fixatedly at the wall opposite her, in the ruins of what was once her skull. Over there you see a woman who is missing both her arms and her lower jaw. Over there you see another who is missing her entire lower half. Where have her legs gone? You have no idea. The injuries inflicted upon those bodies are ghastly. But their advanced decay is enough to turn your stomach. You know not how long these carcasses have been lying down here, but they have begun to putrefy. You fear a similar fate might befall you. Should you stay here? You need to escape. Fifthly, you struggle against the manacles which bind you, but alas, it is of no use. You cannot free yourself from the walls. Your restraints, sorry, your, your restraints are much too strong. And you are much too weak. Panic rises up in your throat, cold and icy, while terror seizes your heart. This too, glacial. It is obvious that escape is impossible, but you still squirm and reef like a rat caught in a firestorm. There is little point, however, to your struggles. You succeed in nothing. As you attempt to free yourself, save making the steel manacles deep into your abused wrists more sharply than ever. You gasp. That hurts. But you ought to have known that would not work. The very definition of insanity is, you know, performing a set action over and over again, hoping for a different response. In that sense, 
Perhaps one can argue optimism is not so very different from insanity. Now, that is an interesting point to consider, would you not agree? No, evidently not. You are still trying to escape, you foolish girl, as if that would do you any good. The clangorous rattling of your steely restraints has rather started to get on my nerves. You are making enough noise to rise the dead down here. There, in your dark, dingy cell, and all your screaming is hardly helping either. Happy matter, so. I wish that you could seize the, let's say, this infernal racket, but I know you will not. Nothing I say could ever get through to you. Not that you have ever listened to me in the first place. Okay, who are we talking about now in the first place? Perhaps you would listen to her, though. Is she not your kind, considerate mistress? Oh, you. Look now, she has come all this way into the deep, sorry, the deep dark, so deep, deep dark depths of the castle's cold, inhospitable dungeon to see you. Is that not kind of her? Oh, dear one, the princess frills, entering the dungeon with a series of light, lifting steps. It would seem like you have finally awoken. How are you? Based on all that infernal racket you've been making, it would seem like you have no shortage of energy. Faithfully, you turn your head so as to meet the eyes of a princess. She is standing but a few paces away, beneath a roughly honed stone arc which bids one entry, but rarely ever an exit to the dungeons. The dungeons are dark and drab, but the princess is wearing her favorite red dress. It is so bright and brilliant that, that for a few moments it hurts you to look at her. Exactly. Once, the red of the princess's outfit makes you think of romance, now it makes you think of violence. You must forgive me for leaving you down here for so long. That was unfair of me. I didn't think of waiting here with you by your son until you awoke, but... Once again, the princess giggles. A light, airy giggle which does not at all suit the situation in which you have found yourself. A dungeon is not a fit place, after all, for a princess. It is horribly cold here. And so very drab, and there is nowhere nice and soft to lay my head. I could have brought my pillows down from my bed, but I suppose, and my blankets, but then they would get have gotten dirty, and that would be a disaster. I need to be more careful. I won't have anybody left to clean up after I my mess is soon, <laughs> not when I've dispatched you. Once again, the princess laughs. Her laughter is light and lifting, like the chiming of a silvery bell. But it does so little to aviate your concern. If anything, it makes you feel even more alarmed. Yeah, exactly. Did she say she meant to dispatch of you? Exactly. Yes, that's right. Could you not tell? I thought you might have figured that out already after waking up in a dungeon, silly. Still smiling, the princess takes another step towards you. Would that you could, you would cringe away from her, but you cannot. You are completely powerless. Yeah. The princess reaches out and places a hand upon your cheek. Her skin is very white, and though her touch is cool, it is less so than the frigid air in the dungeon. Though your body is aching, the princess's touch is gentle and you find yourself leaning into it subconsciously. You wish she would keep holding you. You wish she would keep touching you. You luxuriate in her kindness as best you can. But though the princess's caresses are tender, your circumstances rather undermine them. How can you relax like this? Ah, you're such a good girl, the princess says, in a cajoyly sort of voice, as one might address a cat. You've been so lovely to me while we've been together. I really couldn't ask for a better servant. I just feel as though I've been spoiled. Why then you ask her is she doing this? Improbable though it sounds, she must be one who chained you up. There's nobody else in the castle who could have committed such a feat. Everybody else is dead. Why yes, very house stupid of you. I was the one who orchestrated all of this naturally. Naturally, she says. As for her betrayal as a matter of course, Naturally, why you ask is this so natural to her? What does she mean to do with you? Oh, 
only what I've done with to all of my other servants. I have experienced this sort of thing, so please don't worry. I'll take good care of you. And by take good care of, she means, naturally, I'll kill you. There it is again. That word which seems grossly inappropriate given all which has transpired. Naturally. There's nothing natural about this. Do you not think so? The princess examines you. Her expression ponderous. It's natural to me. Even if it isn't natural to other people, this just feels right. Imprisoning her servants in a dungeon and letting them die? Yes, exactly. There's a bit more to it than that, though. Of course there is. I like you, dear one. The princess says, in a voice which sounds uncommonly serious. You have been good to me, like I said, and kind. For that, I will be eternally appreciative. You have been so good to me. In fact, that simply being with you is not enough. Not anymore. Your company can no longer content me. I'm a greedy, selfish girl, you see. The princess's smile widens into something sinister. Her eyes flashing with a fiendish fervor that you have never before witnessed. And I don't want to feel you beside me. I want to feel you inside me. Well, of all the things your charming, charming captive could have said, you did not expect that. The princess, perhaps noticing your confusion, begins to giggle. A giggle even lighter than Mingring and just as airy. It is just an offensive. I can see that you don't understand, dear one, but you aren't the only one. Our last lady's maid said that too. When the princess sighs, a beleaguered woo in me, so it wooes me, sigh, which makes her look even younger than the, the scant handful of years she truly possesses. And the one before that, and the one before that, and the one before that, so she eats to retain her youthful looks. I thought that you at least might be able to appreciate my point of view, but perhaps not. I don't think it should be too complicated to grasp reality, so really. But maybe my way of looking at the world is a bit, is a bit unique. <laughs> That's what my nurse always used to say, at least when she, when she still had the breath to speak to me. You look at the princess. Where else is there for you to look? Really? Your eyes are fixated to her face. She is still smiling. But there is something sinister about her smile. Or perhaps in your anxious state, you are only imagining that there is something sinister about her smile. It is easy to see things which do not really exist when your surroundings are fastened in shadows. In actuality, however, the princess does not look any different to how she usually does. Neither is she acting any differently to the way she usually does. To act. She has not changed. It is only your perspective of her that has changed. Tremendously, you ask the princess what she means. A question the princess is only too happy to answer. It's simple, really, like you said. You were wondering, weren't you, why there weren't any guards or any servants in the castle when you first arrived here? The question has crossed your mind, yes. You are sure that the princess has said her ministers sent them away, though? Was that a lie? I wasn't being hopefully truthful, no. I thought you would be afraid of me if you knew what had actually happened, and I didn't want that. I wanted you to stay with me. My ministers didn't send anybody away because I didn't have any ministers. I dispatched of them too. Did she now? You suppose you ought not to be surprised, but you still shudder regardless. My ministers weren't very f much fun, I'm afraid. I had a lot of ideas about what I should and shouldn't do after my parents died. The princess stares at you, her eyes wide like black, ho sorry, black holes, empty, yawning abysses. So I killed them. I killed my servants too, but I did a more thorough job with them than I did my ministers. I did not care for my ministers, you see. They were all fusty old men, but I did love my servants. I loved my lady's maids, and my undermaids, and my scully maids, and my housekeeper, and my cooks, and my large retainer of retainers. They were like my family. They raised me in my parents' absence, and I adored them. 
They were so very dear to me that I had no real choice. I had to eat them. Does that follow? Not logically, no. Why are you as a princess, your voice trembling? Would you eat the people that you love? It seems a poor way to repay them for their kindness. Well, why wouldn't you eat the people that you love? I don't think there could be any greater way of showing one's gratitude. Unless you have any better ideas. Yeah, anything other than cannibalism. You weren't expecting the princess to turn the tables on you quite like this, and dumbfounded, you stare at her. You know precious little about love yourself, so it is hard for you to form a convincing rebuttal. But you must throw up a few token arguments. You tell a princess that eating people isn't very nice, and neither is it strictly legal. A better way to show your gratitude to your servants would be with increased wages, or increased holidays. That's logical, yes, but this is not a logical, ideal world. Ah, oh, dearie me. The princess listens to your arguments, her expression astute, like a student poised to take notes in a very important nature. Once you are finished, however, her concentration fails her. Her shoulders begin to shake, but is not with remorse for what she had done. Instead, she is laughing. Oh, dear one. That's very funny, but why should I care about the law? I'm a princess. One day I'll be the queen. I am the law. That is a good point, but would eating people not turn us subjects against her? What subjects? I'm no fool, you know. No matter how I might act, and I know what happens beyond the castle's walls, I know all about the plague. Once, I might have had a populace to govern, but they're all gone now. I'm a princess in nothing but name only. A monarch without any subjects. Does she mean that's sad? I know I do. It's so woefully lonely. If she feels lonely, then why she has been systematically slaughtering all of her domestics? It doesn't make a lick of sense. Perhaps not to you. Gently, the princess caresses your cheek. But I shouldn't judge you too harshly. As much as I like you, dear one, you are a commoner. Perhaps you can't understand the intricacies of my thoughts. Privately, you doubt that anybody would be able to understand the intricacies of the princesses that possess largely because it is unreasonable. You do not say that, though. Instead, you ask her the only question you can think to ask, with your weary throat which is sore from shouting. Why? Why, you ask? The princess blinks. It's because I don't want you to leave me, of course. Everybody leaves sooner or later. Whether they have pledged their allegiance to me or not, they are simply the way of the world. People are fickle and inconsistent, even to me, a monarch. That is why I decided to eat my servants. I have no choice, you see. It was the only way to ensure that they would never leave me. When you think about it, they should be grateful that I would demean myself to, to, to consume their flesh and blood. I am a magnanimous ruler, you see. And I treat all of my subjects equally. Equally as bad. I love every single one of you. And naturally, I love you too. You have been awfully nice to me. And you are very pretty alongside it. If you were a plain ugly girl, perhaps I would not shower you with affection quite as intense as this. But you've captured my heart. I think you're lovely. So, I'll bestow upon you the highest honor I can conceive of. I want your body to mix with mine. Then we can stay together forever and ever. The princess leans in. You can feel her soft, silken hair blushing against your cheeks. You can feel, too, the warmth of her breath as it goes around your skin. It is cold in the dungeon. But the princess's close proximity is pervasive. It's like perverse, though this might sound something of a comfort. Her eyes are wide and her lips are so red. Her smile, meanwhile, is so, so sweet. I've been doing my best to fulfill the role that fate has dictated me, sorry, for me, but really, the princess exhales. Her eyes, which are born into yours, are like two dark tarns. Finally, you think you can see in the alarming lack of light. For lack of anything, in the princess's gaze, some degree of humanity. It gets so lonely here. With this brief flicker of understanding, which passes between the pair of you, 
is soon cut short. The princess dips her head. She parts her lips, which are as red as the petals of a carnivorous flower. You feel the princess's breath against your neck. It is warm in the icy chill of the dungeons, and you shudder from it. For a few moments, you think that this overture of the princesses could be romantic in a way, but this too comes with a swift, merciless close. Oh, the princess's mouth is on your neck. Yikes. Why the neck though? The princess's teeth sharp as needles are in your flesh, so she really is a vampire. The princess is draining your blood. She is sapping on it in great greedy goblets like a hungry animal. One who cannot truly comprehend the harm it is causing. Even as the princess sups from you, her arms twinned around your wrists, you find you cannot hate her. She is far too other, sorry, unworldly. You are sure as your consciousness begins to fade that the princess was being sincere when she spoke of her love for her past servants. This is simply the way the princess expresses this great love of hers, a love which is so very abundant it borders upon the monstrous. It is a love you never thought that you would have ever experienced. This love of princesses ellipses anything that you have ever known before. It eclipses sin eclipses sanity it eclipses reason it eclipses all notions you might once have had of right or wrong the princess as you know full well does not care about such concepts you have always possessed a stubborn core nestled beneath your weak willed exterior but the princess is even stubborner than you are in the fact so in the face of her love you have met your match the princess draws back. Desperately, you gasp for air, but she does not give you any quarter. As before, she dips her head. Her red lips redder, still with your blood, then splits apart her jaw. Her teeth, which are impossibly inhumanly sharp, glint wickedly like knives. Then she tears out your throat. The front of your nightgown was white once. Now it is red. There's so much blood. You can smell it when you inhale. Sharper than metal. It is so potent. You can taste it on your tongue. You try to inhale, but this task proves to be beyond you. What with the twin perforations that have ruptured your skin. Your attempted breaths, when they escape your lips, sound like sad, sorry wheezes. Your whole body, meanwhile, feels as though it is on fire. You may for quite the sorry sight indeed, but you'll forgive me if my sympathy is limited. You did bring this upon yourself, you know. Because sometimes we're going between like a narrative perspective and of course our protagonist. You reap what you sow, and in your case you made a series of bad decisions which led to your untimely demise. Now, what do you want to do? Will you accept this fate of yours and rest in peace? Or you try to fight against it. I mean, of course we're trying to fight against it. This is a good answer. I must admit, I like it. It is impressive how very defiant you can be in a situation as just comforting as this. Now, now, try not to cry, keep your chin up. But this is a minor setback in your story. Like all fair maidens, you are deserving of your own happy ending. You need only the strength to try and seek it out. Why don't we give this another go? Just try not to ensnare the hearts of any more monarchs, particularly those with unusual appetites. You are destined for higher purposes than being an tree, and there are vastly more enjoyable ways to be eaten in this world. Your fate is once again in your hands. Now I wonder, which path will you take? Damn it. <laughs> well then, that would seem to be the case of this little particular tale. Um, I think I'm going to end the video off here, but I just want to see what would happen if we just accept our fate. What, really? Your fun would be to eaten alive in a dark, dingy dungeon? Then being left to rot? That does not sound like a very satisfying ending to this particular narrative. But if that is what you want, then so be it. I do not mind indulging you. That is what I've always done. 
after all. From the moment we first met, wait a minute, is the person that's been stalking to us be, um, what we've seen in the screen, the perspective of the camera? I have dedicated myself tirelessly to answering your wishes, and this is no different. Do not be so foolish to think, though, that you can escape me, even if your life's blood is mingled with that of the princesses. I am not going to relinquish my hold upon you that easily. I did pledge afterwards to remain by your side, come what will, fire or flood. I will never leave you. You will never be lonely again. It gets so lonely here. Yes, that is the name of the game. So, there's definitely some kind of cycle going on here. Because when we go through one set of events, we can then go to another set of events. Gallery. So, we've got different scenes. Yes, go down here. Only got, there's only two pages. So, after the three scenarios, there could be some finale, which involves the final two down here. So, yeah, folks. Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like me to play more of the game as in choose another route to either go to the shore or go to the village then please sure let me know this is quite a interesting tale in itself and remember there's a link down in the description below where you'll be able to download this game for yourselves to play and thank you all so much for watching and see you all in the next time of it gets so lonely here in the woods thank you so much for watching and take care of yourselves